Okay. All right. Aloha, everyone, and welcome to our SPIN workshop on um, benefits planning and learning all about that. We're going to be talking about financing the future. So let me go ahead and get us started for today. Super excited to have you join us. All right. Can I get a thumbs up from our team that you can see my screen okay? Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So my name is Amanda Ka'ahanui, and I am with SPIN. And on behalf of my SPIN sister, Susan Rocco, and our amazing SPIN advisors, we want to welcome you to today's Small Bites workshop on financing the future. My, there it is. So a couple of housekeeping things to go over today before we get started. We were, uh, we'll ask you to please mute yourself and stay muted for the entire presentation. Your video can be on or off, it's up to you. Sometimes your bandwidth is a little better with video off, but if you'd like to be on, that's totally okay. Our presenters will have their videos on while presenting. If you would like to ask a question of our presenters, please use the chat box over on that side. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and just type it in. One of our advisors, Jackie, is going to be monitoring the chat and we'll read them off for you at the end of our presentation. So as we're going through, you have a question, go ahead and type it in so you don't forget and we will get back to them with as much time as we have, okay? If you wanna change your view, there's view options. Generally, they're at the top right corner of your Zoom window, so you can change those. We're going to ask you also to be kind and considerate and respectful, not only to our presenters, but to each other, okay? Any, uh, anything that disrupts our program or if there's anything in the chat that is not appropriate, we will remove that person. Okay, so, and we want to remind you as well that this workshop is being recorded and we will have this video ready to go by the end of next week on our spinconference.org website. Uh, we are excited that Zoom is now providing automatic captioning, so the captions have been turned on. If you would like to have captions for your workshop, please go down to the live transcript button. It's right down here in this little black bar, and you just click on the little up arrow, and it says show subtitles. Or if the subtitles are bothering you after you've turned them on, you can do the same thing and just click on hide subtitles, okay? We invite you to join us for the next two workshops in this series about transition. We have one coming up on May 8th, Pathways to the Future is gonna teach you some marathon skills to keep going and also some tools that you can use to help plan for your child's future. And we have some um, great act people who've actually used the tools to share and talk story. And then in June, we're going to be doing Arriving at the Future. We'll have parents, child teams talking about their transition stories. So be sure to sign up. The website, spinconference.org, allows you to sign up for all three of them. So if you just signed up for today, you can still go back in and register for the next two workshops. We hope to see you there. We wanted to remind you as well that SPIN has two websites. We have our original SPINHawaii.org. That's where you're going to find our Parents' Guide to Special Education, our, our community news, and other resources. And then our newly developed SPINConference.org website is where you're going to find this presentation's recording uh, soon as, next week, as well as our 2020 SPIN Conference workshops. We have um, exhibitor information, so resources in the community you can find there. Uh, and handouts and, and other resources. So please feel free to visit both of those. We will be putting them in the chat later for you, okay? And Susan and I are a two-person SPIN team, uh, but we couldn't do the work that we do without our amazing SPIN advisors. So we have this advisory council uh, set up and they are the ones that are helping us to decide what kind of topics, who the speakers are, and when we meet in person, they help decide what that food's going to look like for lunch. So we really appreciate our SPIN advisors and all they do to help support SPIN and support pa uh, parents and community members like yourselves. So thanks everybody. We also want to remind you to stay tuned till the end of the presentation today. So not only the PowerPoint, but the questions and answers, because I do have two gift cards and they are the little doggies. So be sure and stay tuned. We will draw names using a random number generator based on your registration. Uh, but first, before we get started, I wanted to do a quick poll to see how 
you guys are doing, see who's here today. That that can help our that can help our our visitors. So let me just make sure. Come on, polls. It says I'm logged in from another device. Okay. Well, I think I'll get back to that one because I want us to keep going. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with our presentation today. Uh, we are so excited and honored to have four very dynamic speakers for you. We have three specialists from the University of Hawaii's Center on Disability Studies, Anne Moriasu, Ronald Deese, and Chin Lee. And then we also have Daintree Bartolis. She is from the DD Council and is going to be talking to us towards the end. So I am going to stop my share so that Ronald, you can pick it up and, and go, go crazy. It's going to be great. I'm really excited for you guys. Okay, is my screen coming up now? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So I'm going to pass this over to Annie who will kick us off for our uh, first piece here where we'll talk about some uh, financial resources that we thought everyone should be aware of. Right, thanks, Ronald. Annie Moriasu here. Uh, the first part uh, is in, we're talking about things very much in the overview. And uh, so I won't get into any kind of real detail for that. You'll have to contact us to get more information. Okay, next slide. Um, so this first question here is about um, um, financial plans and about um, why children want to work. And we at, at CDS, and in, particularly in our team, we believe that uh, the best program is really a job. And what I know from a, a lot of young people is regardless of ability or disability is they wanna work. Um, and so what we discuss in uh, the next while is uh, resources that can come from um, disability benefits and so this is why we have this provocative slide here about plans. Some people don't have plans yet, and, and they're, this is an information gathering uh, kind of place that people are coming from. Uh, next slide. So we're gonna discuss, uh, as you can see here, uh, the social security disability benefits, and then uh, those programs, and then Ronald, uh, uh, follow with, uh, with Quest and, uh, and SNAP, and then Chin Lee will uh, talk about employment. Uh, next slide. So these are the, uh, uh, the programs that, th these aren't all of them, but uh, these are the major ones uh, for folks. Sorry, I'm doing the Zoom meeting. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, can you mute yourself, please? Oops, sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I'll start off with the uh, two major programs that most people know about is Supplemental Security Income, SSI, and Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI. Uh, underneath SSDI uh, is Childhood Disability Benefits, which might be the one that applies to a lot of folks who are viewing this in SPIN, uh, Childhood Disability Benefits, CDB. And I, I um, say the, the acronyms out loud um, because uh, moving forward, I'm going to be only using the acronyms. Um, you know, if somebody in the chat box says, uh, somebody else in the chat box will have to, you know, say, what was that again? But I can stop and reiterate what the what that particular program is. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so here you have the big graphic that uh, we use. Social Security Administration has two major programs, um, Supplemental Security Income, SSI on the left, and Social Security Disability Insurance, which is SSDI. Uh, each of them come with their own health insurances. Uh, these two programs are, as I said, the two biggest, hugest programs 
in, inevitably, if you're a working adult and you've worked long enough uh, and have a, uh, in, in, in your life, you will retire, or if you become disabled, um, you will get uh, your, your uh, insurance, you will get your um, benefits from the SSDI section and your insurance would be Medicare. And then supplemental security income is for folks with uh, low income and low assets and Medicaid. So next slide, we go in more detail, I think in the next one, ah, yes. So under um, SSDI, it actually has a few different kinds of doors, or in this case, the graphic shows an umbrella. Because under SSDI, you can get your SSDI through, as I said, retirement or a childhood disability benefits, CDB, or if you're a disabled widow, uh, DWB. Those are um, different ways that you can get it, that you can qualify. Uh, next slide. So um, this is a little backtracking to um, what uh, disability, the uh, sort of an overview of the disability programs under Social Security. Um, if you qualify or if you become eligible um, with your disability status, uh, Supplemental Security in Income, SSI, currently is $794 a month. Uh, Social Security Disability Insurance is based on your work history. So if, you've, if you're a young person and you've only worked for a few years and you um, become disabled, the amount of, of your benefit, of your monthly benefit could be very little as opposed to somebody who has worked has a very long work history and also was a high income um, uh, earner would have a, a much higher monthly income benefit. And then um, as the, you can see from the last one, CDB is based on the parent's work history. Uh, uh, folks who receive CDB uh, don't necessarily have had to have worked because it is based on the uh, parent's work history. They uh, will have um, become disabled before age 22. That's, that's one of the major criteria. Okay, next slide. Um, so in terms of disability, uh, Social Security defines disability as either a physical and or mental impairment, um, and also the inability to work at what is called the substantial gainful activity level. And so for <clears throat> um, for folks who are not blind, that amount is uh, $1,310 a month, if you are working at less than that amount, or blind, then the amount is a little higher, well, actually quite a bit higher, is $2,190 a month, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, next slide. So with um, SSI, if you recall from the previous slide, um, it's its own program, um, and it's it is basic. It is called uh, the payer of last resort, meaning um, if you have no other you know uh, resources, if you if you don't qualify for SSDI, then you could qualify for SS. You could get SSI, and that's based on limited income. Um, I'm the, we had the income slide in the previous slide and limited assets. So limited assets means $2,000 in the bank. That amount has not changed in decades. And for those of you um, old enough to remember, uh, the dollar is worth probably a third of what it used to be from decades ago. So that $2,000 has not changed. What has changed is everything else, which is the the cost of living, et cetera. Um, and then um, for, uh, for those under 18, um, parental income could be um, counted. Uh, next slide. Um, when, um, if a child is um, becoming eligible or reaching that age, um, 
there is what is called a redetermination at age 18. And, it, and that's because prior to that, uh, the criteria, uh, as you can see from, from that bullet point, the criteria for, for school age versus adult is different. And it has a lot to do with um, the qualities of and factors of, as, is this person able to possibly work, um, even, even volunteer uh, as an adult? And that could qualify them or disqualify them uh, determining, de depending on the redetermination. So it's not automatic. Um, let's just say that. OK, uh, next slide. Um, SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, I, I, we talked about work history. Uh, as I said, if, um, if there's, if you're a young person and you, you know, you would, you would get a much smaller income, um, uh, benefit income than if somebody who's worked long enough in the system. So <clears throat> you can go to this SSA.gov planners credits etc. HTML and look at what that is. Or if uh, you could uh, on ssa.gov actually create your own account and it would actually project what your uh, retirement income or your disability income could be. Um, it, it, it can do it uh, do the work for you in terms of the calculation. Um, in general, we say that if you've worked if you have like 10 years of work, um, you probably qualify for SSDI depending on the amount of, of income that you have made. And that detail, of course, uh, you would learn <laughs> if you've gone through our, our uh, orientation. Okay, next slide. Uh, CDB, Childhood Disability Benefits. Uh, as, as you recall from the previous slide, the beneficiary uh, needn't have worked, and it is based uh, on the uh, parent's income, on the parent's social security income, and it's also based on if they, uh, if the child, adult child, that is, uh, acquired the disability before age 22, um, and the parent must have, uh, again, worked uh, long enough in the in the system so that they have. Um, qualified for uh, retirement or disability through Social Security, or have passed away and worked long enough under Social Security. And it, it uh, I've met young people who actually have, um, are beneficiaries of their grandparents' work record. So um, all of those things can, can happen and you might have, um, and a, a disabled adult child who has a, um, a CDB benefit that's um, pretty high, depending on the, the parent or grandparent's earning record. So something to think about. All right, next slide. Ah, um, you, like, as I said, you can go to ssa.gov and um, and create your own account. Um, and I, uh, I did that. I, I encourage other people to do it. Um, it. It will take you through different kinds of um, um, major areas. Um, not only can you check your own uh, retirement uh, amount, projected retirement uh, amount, but you can also actually begin your application for um, disability benefits online. They, it's a, it's a very good website and, and takes you through all of the steps, prepares you for what you need to do. Um, this, this is very, it's a really good resource for parents in particular, I think. Um, uh, next slide, sorry. Uh, we put in here uh, really quickly the um, the Social Security office numbers, the field office numbers. Um, currently, because of COVID, <clears throat> uh, even though it seems like it's we're turning the corner, uh, you can't go there for any kind of in-person uh, visits. 
you can talk to them um, through their their uh, toll free numbers. Um, um, and that toll free number, the 1 800 772 1213, is national. <clears throat> so you could be, um, if you have general questions, you know, you have to go through the maze of, of the phone automatic stuff, but it will, you will eventually talk to someone, but it could be someone on the East Coast or Central or Mountain. Um, but they can do a lot for you in terms of uh, answering um, a lot of basic questions and, and, um, and, and particular specialized questions, especially if, if your child or you are planning to return to work or start work and want to know how um, your employment will affect your social security benefits. So we can, we can help out there and social security administration is actually our key partner in um, getting the documents for, um, for being able to do benefits uh, planning assistance. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here's a quick question. Um, we have this as a typical kind of test that, that uh, Ronald and I do when we're doing transition presentations is we ask when receiving SSI before age 18, can it continue after age 18? And so if you don't- The pop-ups are happening, it's, it's ah, working. There we go. Yes, let's put the, the slide on the side. So if you thought, if you, they should see, so everyone should see a pop up on the screen where they can answer what they think it would be right now. Mm -hmm. and give it about 30 seconds. While you guys do that, they have a few questions about uh, why would somebody apply when they're chow? Uh, I, address a little bit of that in the chat room, but we can we can look at it, it, it. We can address it to the whole group. Oh, thanks, Jen. I haven't been, I, you know, too busy to look at chat, but yeah. Ooh, it looks like, it looks like the uh, third answer is winning. So a youth has supplemental security income before age 18. Can they keep the SSI benefit after they turn 18? And the most popular answer is maybe they have to be reevaluated at age 18. And that, that's what happens. They get reevaluated under the adult rules, uh, even, even if they've been receiving benefit already. So on the same note, this is Chin Lee. On the same note, um, there were questions in the chat room about uh, why do we need do we need to wait until age eighteen to reply apply or should the parent apply after age eighteen? It really depends because if the child is under age eighteen, Social Security will consider the parent income an asset when they look at el the eligibility. Right. So if you are if you are, as a parent are making you know. Um, you know, over a certain amount, amount of income and a certain amount of resources, Social Security will not award SSI to your kids. Uh, when the kids turn 18, they can apply on their own. And, and you know, then Social Security only going to consider the child income and asset, you know, uh, when they determine eligibility. So then there's another question say, why, uh, why would somebody apply as a child? Because if the child needs resources, under 18 and the, the family as a whole need resources, they have limited income and limited asset, then they can apply and get these additional resources for the kids and for the, you know, a little bit of extra uh, financial help from social security. When you apply as a kid, you, so your, let's say your family have limited income and limited resources, social security award your child SSI. And th this is when this slide, when they turn 18, this is when this slide happened. 
they will con they will only continue if Social Security do an age 18 redetermination and find that your kids is still qualified under the different eligibility when they turn 18. So you can apply as a kid if you have your family have limited resources and limited income and get SSI for your kids as additional resources, financial resources. But if you, you know, uh, if your family didn't, you know, isn't going to be able to meet the eligibility when your kid is under 18, then you can apply for the kid when they're turn 18, then they're only going to evaluate the kid on their own. Thank you, Chen. Okay, should we move to next, next topic? Yes, yeah, so does is there another poll? Um, another uh, question here? No, that's just that one, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Over to you, Ronald. Okay, so we Annie talked about the social security programs and how that can uh, provide income or financial support. But we also wanted to talk a little bit about some very important health insurance programs, because this is this is also a big part of the financial picture, because uh, these programs such as Medicaid or what we call in Hawaii the Quest program. Can, can pay for services that are necessary for independent life and uh, a lot of things that could not be afforded on their own with uh, just the income the person has on their own. So just briefly, we wanted to talk about our state's Medicaid or what we call the Quest program. Uh, for those that haven't heard of this, this is a state-run health insurance program for people with low income and little or no resources. Uh, you saw in our, a little bit back, how it was sort of attached to the SSI program because the eligibility is kind of similar. You have to have pretty limited uh, financial means, but if you are covered by this program, the coverage is typically free and it can cover a lot of things. It can cover your, uh, what's normally covered by health insurance, uh, doctor visits, tests, treatments. It can cover things like medication. Uh, it can also cover certain specialized services that are specific to people with uh, significant disability, including this thing called developmental disability home and community-based services. These are very uh, intensive services for people with a significant developmental disability that enables them to live in the community. Um, these are a lot of things. It can be things like uh, a day program that they go to each day to work on life skills. It can be a personal care attendant that helps them cook and take care of themselves. Uh, it can even be uh, things like uh, a job coach to help them uh, learn to be employed. So these are, these are pretty significant. Um, who, who receives coverage through Quest? This is actually a very broad program that covers a lot of families in Hawaii. Uh, it, can be covering children, uh, former foster children, pregnant women, parents, non-disabled adults. But the thing uh, we, we deal with a lot is folks that are aged, blind, or disabled and have a real significant need for uh, low cost health coverage. So here are some of the requirements for someone to apply for and receive Medicaid. Uh, put, put very briefly, because all those different groups I showed have different uh, rates at which they can qualify. But uh, in general, we're talking about very limited household income and limited household resources. So instead of just looking sort of at the individual like SSI, uh, you're looking at sort of a whole household. And if someone is under 18, they're grouped together with the parents. So this, this is kind of a similar concept to SSI because uh, 
the parents and the child are together and they're looking at in some way all of their income. Now, when someone becomes over 18, they can apply for Medicaid on their own, not including their parents' income, because now as an adult, they can be considered a household of one. And th this is possible uh, in some cases, even if they're, they're living with their family, as an adult, they can be considered like for Medicaid purposes, a household of one after the age of 18, but not before. So here are some resources. If you wanna know if Medicaid is an option, you can hop onto this website medical.mybenefits.hawaii.gov. And you can file uh, an actual application here all, all online. Uh, and you can also do an eligibility pre-assessment where you answer some questions about the family and uh, see if it seems like you, uh, you'd qualify. And other than that web base, I know not everyone can get online. Uh, there is a general customer service number we're sharing here and a Medicaid ombudsman number uh, that someone can call with uh, questions or issues come up around Medicaid. Uh, I wanna talk about one other uh, income support program. Uh, also briefly, the SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, you may be familiar with this under some other names. It's sometimes called a, a food stamp program that used to be the old name, but they sort of changed it now that it's no longer uses stamps. So this program uh, provides uh, cash assistance in the form of a EBT card, electronic benefits transfer card to uh, someone with low income so that they can purchase food uh, to access a healthier diet. So it can be used for things like uh, shopping at most grocery stores for uh, we might call cold foods or ingredients, but you can't purchase like prepared foods with it. So, you know, this is one part of the picture for a lot of people because SSI is not a ton of money to 794 a month. So this kind of supplements the food budget. Uh, some of the requirements for SNAP uh, are a little different from some of the other programs. Uh, some ways it's similar because they also look at a household and the household has to have a limited income and limited resources as well. Now, when it comes to a household, if a parent and child are living together, they're considered one household until age 22. Uh, so that, you know, a lot of the ones we talked about were based on age 18, but SNAP is until age 22 in the state of Hawaii. Uh, once someone is 22, they can be considered their own household and can apply for SNAP on their own without considering parental income, as long as they are able to say they uh, separately are going to prepare their food and meals. So one of the things that uh, to be aware of with SNAP is that they have these things called work requirements where uh, many adults uh, receiving SNAP need to meet certain work requirements to continue receiving it after a period of time, after three months. Uh, so when it comes to this, there are different things they have to do. They have to make a certain number of work hours or show efforts in searching for a job and or attending training, things like that. Uh, the thing about these work requirements are uh, uh, my, minors are exempt for these and adults that are disabled are exempt from these. So when, when it comes to SNAP benefits, uh, it is important 
that they know someone is considered disabled uh, when it comes to these requirements. So that, that can generally be proven by showing the person has a social security disability benefit. And there are also some other ways to do it if they're disabled but have never applied for social security. Ronald, you're at 10 minutes. Okay, so let's, you know, move past this. So SNAP website is here. Uh, this is a new website. You can apply online for SNAP benefits. And here is the public assistance information line where you can get information. And the only other way to apply other than that website now is to download and print this application form and mail it in. And I provided the current link that was being distributed. And oh, it's another kind of discussion point here. What services can be paid for by Medicaid by Quest in Hawaii? And oh, I guess I shouldn't spend too long on this. We gotta make sure we get through our time. So we'll just give a 20 seconds here and you can see what we think. And uh, you know, the most popular answer I'm seeing is that all of these things can be paid for by Medicaid. And that's, and that's pretty much true. Doctors, medication, special services like home and community-based services can be paid for, but you do have to uh, you know, meet the requirements, medically speaking, to get those services covered. So let's move on to another source of financial support that is in people's lives, employment. So employment is how a lot of us uh, get our financial support. Um, and you know, this is even possible for people with disability benefits. Uh, you may have some benefit and some employment. You may transition from benefits to employment. And that's a lot of the work our center does, like helping people around that area. So I wanted to share one story about employment uh, and which you can also see on this website here, The choosework.ssa.gov, the Ticket to Work program. So Amy was a girl, uh, Amy is uh, a woman in Maine who was receiving SSI benefits uh, back in 2012. And she shared her story that uh, she progressed toward employment over a period of many years. So when she was young, she had a lot of trouble with uh, things like reading, uh, math, uh, social interactions. She had a developmental disability, but she received some assistance to progress on the road to employment. She worked with the Montgomery County Vocational Rehab Program. Uh, they plugged her in with this program called Project Search that placed her in an internship with the county government. And they connected her with this agency called Full Circle Employment Solutions that uh, counseled her on how her employment would affect her disability benefits and provided a job coach that went with her to her job, helped her learn her job, and helped her develop uh, soft skills like time management and managing her emotions and staying organized. And by 2017, uh, Amy had actually got a full-time job with the uh, Montgomery County Department of Finance uh, as an administrative person. They were so impressed by her work ethic that they hired her after her internship. So employment it is possible in some form for everyone. Everyone starts at a different place and they have their own goal, but it's something we want you to consider as being in the picture. One of the things that help with this is these rules called work incentives. Social security has special rules built into their programs called work incentives that make it easier for people to work. 
And one of the things they can do is extend eligibility for medical benefits or cash benefits or help get services that help someone transition to self-sufficiency. Uh, different work incentives are available for each of these different benefit programs we've talked about today. So the, one resource is this Social Security Red Book, which you can find online that talks about Social Security work incentives. But another resource is benefits planning, meeting with a benefits counselor that's an expert in these rules so that they can inform you about how these rules work. And maybe they talk to the individual, maybe they talk to a whole family, uh, but they want to give them the information to make informed decisions about work. And from here, I want to pass it to well, Chin oh, Lee. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. There, there are a lot of question about, about uh, the social security eligibility as we introduce them so which, which is yeah. great because i mean trying to answer them on the chat while, while annie and rano present uh it's great because there's a lot of interest and and, and curiosity about social security but it, it's also um, important for us to share some of the resources available if you need to look into more detail because some of the question you guys are asking uh had to deal with very specific uh, individualized uh, a, a type of situation. So there are a few resources available in Hawaii, uh, you know, that, that you, can, can, you, can, you can get help with. There's a program called Work Incentive Plan Planning and Assistance Program, uh, short, you know, WIPA program. And that we also have a contract, uh, CDS, Center on Disability Study, also have a contract with Division of Vocational Rehab. And then the DD Division also have, um, uh, if you have Medicaid and home and community-based services and exploring employment, the DD division can actually give you some uh, help with benefit planning. They have a benefit planner, benefit counselor registry on their website that you can look for uh, and get help or, or, or with that. Uh, on top of that, there are some employment network that are approved by Social Security to, to be able to help you with employment and along with benefit planning resources. Uh, I have two 30 second video that I'm gonna share that can sums up uh, a lot of things that we, we the, all the resources that we're sharing, but ultimately what we wanted to do today uh, by, by introducing you the social security program in the beginning to show that there are financial resources that you can get help with uh, it, should you need help. But once you get those resources, the social security, SSI or SSDI or CBD, even healthcare, Medicaid, Medicare, ER, like Ronald introduced SNAP, there are incentive among those programs to help you to get employed, to get employment while keeping those benefits as well. So you don't have to get, just rely on social security benefits. Uh, you can maintain some of the benefits and go to work. And if your health situation allows, you can actually you know, go to work and maintain those social security benefits. And if you can work more, you can actually keep working income, getting more employment income and actually get off those benefits. And there are also safety net that we can talk about should you need to go back to those program again, right? So, so there are program about social security, from social security, uh, the, the WIPA program, there's a contract with DVR and there's also resources with DDD and other employment network. So give me one more minute. I'm gonna share those video and then we can transition to, uh, to, 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 to uh, Daintree. So let me. And you're just, uh, just under two minutes. Yeah, yeah. The short videos we have. Yeah, it's really short. So let me go Actually, to the screen. Uh, yeah, right here. Okay. This is the Social Security WIPA program. So let me enlarge it. Wait. Sorry, I need to make sure that I'm sharing sound. Okay, here you go. If you have SSI or SSDI, employment can be confusing and scary. You need information so you can make informed choices. Contact the Hawaii WIPA program. We can help you understand Social Security's rules to make a plan for the future. Visit us online at higherabilitieshawaii.org slash WIPA. So for this WIPA program, you do have to be a social security recipient and uh, you're either getting employed or 
uh, considering employment. And for the DVR project, we also make a video about that. And for the DVR project, you have to be a DVR client and then the counselor will refer you to the service and then you'll be able to get uh, benefit planning through Center on Disability Study. And we also provide similar service as well. Let me show you the video. You just got a job. If you collect SSI, SSDI, or simply aren't sure what type of benefit you receive, you may need benefits planning. Benefits planning helps you understand how your earnings can affect your benefits so that you can make informed decisions about your work. Visit us at higherabilitieshawaii.org. You just got so out of time. I'll post those links in the chat box so you guys have it. And the resources will also be available at the SPIN conference website. Uh, and, and I know there's, we have only very limited time. So we're moving very fast. And I know there's, we, we probably generate more curiosity and question along the way. And, and which is good because yeah. now you're thinking ahead. Uh, please look out for us. You know, we, when you contact us, we'll, we'll tell you how we can help you either to the WIPA program or we'll ask if you're a DVR client, then we can refer you to the DVR benefit planning services. We can also ask you to go to DDD, which they also provide limited benefit planning services uh, for the people who are on the uh, com home and community-based services as well. I think my time is up. And if you have more questions, you can still reach out to us on the chat and I can continue to answer them. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Team CDS. We really appreciate that. It was a lot of information, so don't worry, guys. This is going to be recorded. It's being recorded right now, and we're going to have it on our SPIN conference website, and we'll drop the link to the chat in there for you, okay? Before we begin, I did get my polls going, as you saw, so let's see who's here today. I'm going to run this poll real quick, and then we're going to move on to Daintree. Okay, so if you can see that, just kind of let us know. There's a couple questions in there. Are you a parent? Are you a caregiver? Are you a teacher or other professional? Are you a student or self-advocate? Let us know where you're living, which island you're on, or if you're from a US territory or from the mainland or somewhere else. Uh, let us know what age your children are. That helps us as we do these um, plannings for, for the next workshops. And, and what you know about transition. So before we started today, even after, you know, what is your understanding of what transition means to you as a parent? I, I have a 17 year old and I'm still learning as I go. So I feel like I have a handle on it. And then I listen to a presentation like this. It's really so much information and I go, hmm, I definitely think I need to learn some more. So let this go for about five more minutes or five more seconds. You have a chance just to glance through, helps us to see who's here today. And we should be able to see them. We have a lot of parents. I'm so happy to hear that. A lot of folks from Oahu, but we've got some Maui and Big Island folks with us. Uh, we've got kids in different rate, age ranges, elementary, middle school, high school, recently transitioned. We've got some adults here. And we have, most folks know a little bit about transition, which is super, super great. So this should help you to build those skills, yeah? So. Okay, so we would love to now invite Daintree to go ahead and unmute yourself. I have a flyer I'm going to share with you folks so that Daintree can talk about that. Hey guys, how's it going? So I'll wait for this um, flyer to pop up and I believe it's going to be on the ABLE account first. And here we go, here we go. Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, so an able update. So first I'm gonna show you this flyer and then I'm gonna let you guys know where we're at in Hawaii for Hawaii's able. So uh, achieving a better life experience, that's what able stands for. So we use acronyms a lot and I apologize for that. I would like to say it's gonna change, but it's not. So just remember able stands for achieving a better life experience came out in 2014. Hawaii jumped right on it in 2015. We started our, I mean, excuse me, we passed ours. It's not started yet. So basically individuals and their families can deposit up to about $15,000 a year into an ABLE account. 
It's about a thousand dollar cap. Um, each state can verify uh, vary it. So right now, a thousand dollars is a is a minimum, but we might be able to go a little bit higher in Hawaii, and we'll find out about that come June or Ju July. What are qualified expenses under the ABLE? So you could pay with um, health, wellness, prevention, housing, financial management, education, transportation, job training and support, assistive technology, funeral and burial expenses. Wellness, um, health, wellness, and prevention. I want to talk just a little bit more about that because uh, individual want to use an ABLE account to fly to Florida and go to Disney. And they're like, can that? And they said, yes, because that's something the individual has always wanted to do. He wanted to see his relatives. He's never read, met his relatives before. So psycho social needs can also be paid through for the way, uh, through the ABLE account. He also paid for his staff member to go with him. So those are qualified expenses. So it's pretty broad. So it's an awesome program. Who is eligible? Current eligibility is limited to persons whose disability occurred prior to the age of 26. So the key word here is the disability occurred prior to the age of 26. The person might be 80 years old. In my case, I take care of Alice. She's 81. She was 81 when she opened up her ABLE account. So it's not the age they opened the ABLE account, it's the age the disability occurred. Proof of the eligibility, receiving SSI or SSDI, or they meet the SSA's definition of eligibility. It's pretty straightforward there, guys. So does the state of Hawaii offer an ABLE account? Not yet. And I'm going to get into that presentation in just a minute. This is a segue. We've joined the consortium of ABLE for All Savings a Plan to the state of Oregon. Thank you, Amanda. Let's go to the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> All right. I mumble my words. Slow me down. Somebody yell out loud if I talk too fast, please, because I have a tendency to do that. Thank you, Jen. He gives me the best compliments. Um, okay, here we go. Able Working Group. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. So let me see where I'm at here on my slide presentation. Okay. So, um, yeah. So the Able Working Group, is this the first slide? Amanda, can you go to the front? This is the last slide. There we go. I was like, wait. All right. Update to Hawaii's Able Savings Program. Thank you. Next slide, Amanda. Thank you so much. Purpose. I want to provide you an update today about where our Hawaii Able Savings Program is at. And we want to gain your thoughts. So please email us and let us know what your thoughts are and how we could, what else we can do for Hawaii's Able. Next slide. Um, so what is an Able um, account? An ABLE account, also known as a 529 ABLE, or an ABLE uh, 529A account, is a state-ran savings program for eligible, pe eligible people with disabilities in the United States. Rules governing ABLE accounts are codified in Internal Revenue Code 529, hence the 529 ABLE account. Okay. It was enacted by the Achieving a Better Life Experience. In 2014, the Hawaii ABLE Savings Program will be an option for Hawaii residents seeking to open an ABLE account. Next slide. In July 2019, a decision was made by um, the State of Hawaii Department of Budget and Finance to join an ABLE consortium to offer the Hawaii ABLE Savings Program to Hawaii residents. To select, the, um, to select which ABLE consortium to join, Budget and Finance issued a request for proposal known as, a, as an RFP based on a criteria of the RFP, a selection committee ranked Oregon Treasury Savings Network as the best ABLE consortium to join. In August 2020, the RFP process was completed. During the month of September to December 2020, um, initial discussions were held with the Oregon Treasury Savings Network. However, because of COVID-19, um, the health emergency, we agreed to um, postpone the start of the implementation until January 2021. Next slide. Thank you. You're at five minutes. Thank you. Oh, I'll be faster than that. Um, 
Currently, a team of Hawaii State, oops, sorry. Currently, a team of Hawaii, has to, um, currently a team of Hawaii State officials are working with representatives from o Oregon Treasury Savings Network to create and implement a plan, review legal documents and agreements, conduct outreach to public and program design, um, develop a marketing plan and a design for a website for account holders to manage their ABLE savings account. The time frame to complete this work is four to six months. So we're hoping by mid-July to mid-August 2021, we'll have this done. Next slide. As a part of the implementation work, a series of go, no-go decision to proceed will be made by the Director of Finance. The criteria to proceed is the successful completion of legal agreements, the determination of value of ABLE account holders for participating in the Oregon Treasury Savings Network, the accountability by uh, potential account holders of the future of the program. For go, no go, it just means how soon are we going to start? It's always going to be a go but it just depends on how soon it's going to happen. So hopefully we'll get the go by mid-July. Next slide. Okay. An advisory group consisting of the following members has been established to make a recommendation to the director of finance on decisions to proceed. And you can read the members there. The point of contact is me, Dane Bartolos, the Hawaii State Council, Development of Disabilities um, Division, um, executive director, sorry, my email address. Next slide. Okay. Now I'll explain, um, I will explain our ABLE working group, which consists of individuals <clears throat> with disabilities, their support workers and agencies and organizations who support individuals with disabilities. The working group will be reconvening and bring back representatives from Oregon Treasury Network for more con um, conversation to provide feedback to get additional questions answered. I'll be seeking input from the ABLE Working Group on program features, our website, our branding, and outreach strategies. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Our next slide will show you, um, I want to recognize the key partners. Okay, I need to give a huge shout out to Senator Susie Chun Oakland. Susie was able to get these people together and meet with the budget and finance people. So I appreciate that so much. So with our group who have reconvened and who have started this with us is a Center on Disability Studies. Hawaii Disability Center, um, excuse me, <clears throat> Hawaii Disabilities Rights Center, Special Parent Information Network, Disability and Communication Access Board, Executive Office on Aging, Aging and Disability Resource Center, Hawaii Self-Advocacy Advisory Council, Department of Human Services, MedQuest Division, and the National Down Syndrome Society. And I know there's been a lot of other people. So that's um, about all I have for where we're at right now with the um, Hawaii ABLE account. We'll be doing outreach more. We have one more presentation with our um, Oregon people that are co is coming up, I believe on the 27th, but we'll send that information out to you folks. And we're gonna be working on our network of individuals and getting our website up to date and all that sort of stuff. So it's really exciting that um, we're getting this going. Again, the law passed in 2015. It's taken us six years to get here. But I want to give a big shout out to Mark Anderson of Budget and Finance. If it hadn't been for him, we wouldn't have been able to get this going. And Caroline Cadillar from Executive Office on Aging, that's really helped us. And now <clears throat> this segues us in to Cal's Law. Thank you, Amanda, for bringing this up. So Cal's Law is Hawaii Medicaid Income Disregard Program. And so we feel this might even be better than a, a Medicaid buy-in because you don't have to pay. A Medicaid buy-in would be that you have to pay for it. The Medicaid Income Disregard Program allows people to 
make a certain amount of money and it's disregarded. So let's just go to the, through these points. This law eliminates barriers to employment. Many people with disabilities in Hawaii have been afraid to find a job for fear of losing Medicaid coverage. Medicaid may be the only medical insurance available to the individuals, and it may also need needed to receive Medicaid. It was named after Cal Warrington Selvert. Cal was a bright college student with a disability who dreamed of one day becoming a professor and a writer. Sadly, he learned he could never have the dignity of earning a comfortable living because he needed nursing services for Medicaid to live. He needed round the clock nursing. He could stop breathing if he hiccuped. So it was really a heartbreaking situation there. Okay, so the law covers most workers with disabilities to be eligible to the income disregard. Workers with disabilities must be between the ages of 16 to 64. Workers will be able to have a higher earnings Income up to 138% of the federal poverty level is disregarded when determining eligibility for Medicaid. With all deductions, a worker can up to $5,000 a month, sorry guys, and keep his or her Medicaid coverage. So what I was told in layman's terms is at minimum wage, you could work full time, 40 hours a week and still keep your Medicaid. Then individuals are asking me, but Daintree, how about the company then will have to pay for their medical insurance? You could have dual coverage, guys. So the company you work for, you might get HMSA insurance or HMA insurance. But you could also have the secondary Medicaid so you can keep your like home and community-based services that Ronald and Annie talked about a little bit earlier today. So you can have dual coverage and that's okay. The law will be applied to wages earned this year. Once Cal's law goes into effect, it will apply to wages earned as of July, um, excuse me, January 1st, 2021. Individuals who may have been turned down for Medicaid earlier this year because of the income was too high may want to reapply for the new rule. So that you need to keep in mind. So that's pretty much all I have at this time for you folks, but please feel free to email me and ask me more questions. Um, right now, our um, CALS law is going through what's it's called an SPA. It's something that's sent to CM Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. So Hawaii did an amendment to their Medicaid to allow this exception to be put in place. So that's where we're at. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Any questions? Go ahead. That was awesome. Thank you, Jane Tree. And so we will we'll be putting the links in the chat for the ABLE Act and Cal's Law. So you can see those. And they are also on our website, spinconference.org. Uh, we have a special tab to set up for these mini transition workshops. And you can find all of the handouts and the presentations from today, as well as this recording will be up next week. But if you need the stuff right away, all of the handouts and slides are available for you to see. OK, so wow, I learned so much today. And I, I don't know about you guys, if you still have questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat. We're going to have um, Jackie go ahead and read some of them. I know that Chin was very active in the chat. Thank you. And Kelly, appreciate your input in there. Um, so some of those questions may have got answered, but you can go ahead, Jackie, and unmute yourself and ask some of those questions. Hi. I, yes, I do want to say thank you to everyone who uh, put questions into the chat box. I think almost all of them got answered. I know from the earlier presentation, Terry asked, is someone able to get SSDI and SSI? And I wasn't sure if that one was answered. We put... I'm gonna put that to Ronald. I know for individuals and our licensed and certified home, they do receive SSI, like maybe even $10 because that gives them the level of care payment. So Ronald, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so folks can receive both SSI and SSDI, but the SSDI pays first and it reduces the amount of SSI you're receiving. So it's not like you get both and they add together, uh, the SSI might go down once you start getting uh, SSDI. 
And uh, in in general, uh, when the S the SSI will kick in if the SSDI is too low. If it can't give you at least as much as the SSI would give you, uh, you'll get both. Thank you. And the only other question are, are the SSI incomes nationally or in the state of Hawaii, the numbers that we were given in the presentation? Uh, mo for the most part, it's set nationally. Uh, there are there is a higher rate paid in Hawaii for people in certain types of domiciliary care homes. Uh, that's pretty rare. Um, but uh, for the most part, the seven ninety four a month applies to most people. Okay, thank you. And Rose just popped a question in. If we decide on changing our legal last name on documents, how difficult would it be if even if you're born out of state? possibly free from POA or any other legal documents. We probably defer that to spin. Yeah. Yeah, more resources. Right, and I'm not sure about that one, Rose, but we have your contact information and we can try and help you find someone that can assist you with that, okay? Oh, folks, I, I'm sorry, Amanda, I have one other quick thing to put in here right now. Individuals, although um, Hawaii ABLE is not up and running yet, we encourage you to join ABLE for All because once you go into there, that's a consortium we joined. And when Hawaii ABLE um, comes up activated, you can roll it over to um, Hawaii ABLE quickly. Thanks, Daintree, and I will. I just went to go and find. Oh, thanks, Ronald. I was just looking for that link. Uh, Ronald dropped the link for Able for All, so you are able to now go and sign up for an Able account. And as I understand, Daintree, when Hawaii's becomes official, it'll roll into the Hawaii Able account. That's that's correct. If you want to, and so we'll um, individually would ask the person, of course, first. And if you need help, call me up or email me. I'll help you um, sign up for that Able account. Not a problem. Thank you. Is there any other questions? I think I see one more here. Steve asked if I earn money uh, greater than $5,000 a month under Cal's law, wouldn't my savings eventually disqualify me from Medicaid? Excellent question. And that's why we um, put in Cal's law in the ABLE Act. Um, when Cal's law passed, People approach the council and said, you know, great, that's for earnings, but I want to save money. Where's the ABLE account? So that's where the ABLE account comes in to help support that. So your savings, you can go ahead and have that. Does that make sense? That does. Thank you. Okay, so any last questions? Go ahead and pop them in the chat. If there's anything else that Ron or Annie or Chin or Daintree wants to share. You know, sometimes I know if I'm doing a presentation, I get through it and then I go, darn, there was that one thing I wanted to make sure that I forgot to do. So if there's anything else that you guys want to pop in and share with folks, go ahead and unmute and let, and let them know. Yeah, I do see that Marsha has a hand up. Daintree, you're muted. I'm sorry, what was the question? I said Marsha has a hand up, so I wasn't sure if we uh, were going to unmute her or if she was going to type her question into the chat box. I've um, released the mute, so Marsha, if you if it's easier for you, I've un uh, you should be able to unmute and ask your question. Thank you. So my question is, um, currently uh, my adult son is under um, SSDI. Uh, several years ago, he was also. Um, categorized as being legally blind. Um, and I noticed that in, in the seminar today, the one of the disability benefits for a blind person um, is significantly higher than what he is receiving currently. Um, so how does that affect his um, benefits? Okay. 
the amount of the SSDI benefit uh, is based on someone's own work history. So the longer he works and pays into social security fund, uh, the more his benefit will go up uh, over time. And we also mentioned that um, other benefit, the childhood disability benefit, uh, that is based on a parent's work history. All, all the years of employment go into a formula. So when a parent uh, retires, becomes disabled or passes away, the child would become potentially eligible for a higher benefit. Uh, and that, that eventually happens for everyone. Uh, the restriction on that benefit is they have to have been disabled before age 22, uh, which, which is most of the people we meet through SPIN, uh, disabled from a young age. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I, I, I think I'm confused and as far as his, what he's considered if, if it was under SSDI because he's not current, he's not working full time. Um, so I don't know, I'm sorry. I think it might be just under SSI then, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, Masha, they, uh, maybe it's best if we like talk offline to understand the specific situation for you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Because, yeah. Because, um, yeah, sort it, it out. Uh, yes, we can sort it out, yeah. You know, you, you, for SSI and SSDI purposes, you know, you, for a legally blind person who is recognized by Social Security, you may be able to get more help uh, in terms uh -huh. of the work incentive portion. You may not necessarily get more money because you have, you're legally blind. Um, so so we, we can help you with that, yeah. Thank yeah. you, appreciate it. For our CDS well, folks, can you put your contact uh, email or phone number in the chat so people can reach out to you, please? Sure, I'll put, I'll put our email up there. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Susan has put our evaluation link in the chat box. If you can please help us to um, see how we did today and how we improve for the next workshop and just take a few moments and fill out our evaluation. If you click on any of those live links, it's gonna open up a tab in your web browser and you can get to them later. If you download any of the flyers, it will download, you get that little arrow so that you can view them as well. And again, these will all be available on our website, spinconference.org. Thank you, Chen, for putting in your phone number and email there. And for the Higher Abilities website, you can see that linked there too. Okay, anybody else have any last questions? Go ahead and pop them in the chat. Otherwise, I am going to say thank you to our presenters. Thank you to Jackie for helping us with our questions. And before you go today, I do have these two gift cards from Target, $25 each that we would like to give out. I used a random generator number uh, things. So uh, based on who's here today, because we thank you and want to reward you for coming in person. So our first winner of a $25 gift card from Target is Gary Chun. Gary Chun, congratulations. I've got your email. Uh, so we will email you and get your address. Okay. And our second person winning a second $25 gift card from Target is Richard Estrada. Congratulations, Richard Estrada and Gary Chun. A teacher and a parent, respectively. So thank you for joining us. Okay, if we don't see any more in the chat, we will go ahead and release everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first Small Brights presentation around transition and financing the future. You guys all have a great day. Aloha.